Hello. Is this on? Ah, good morning. That's got anointing all over it. You can feel it. Oh, I love worship. Anyone else? What a way that it just really changes when we enter into our time together, when we have an opportunity to worship him like that, just abandon ourselves and sing. Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that this morning you just come into our midst and inhabit these words we share this morning, Lord, and you have inhabited our praise. God, I ask that as we go throughout our day, that we become sensitive to the encounter, to the interruptions as your son was. And that we step out in faith, believing what you have called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've got one quick announcement. I had the good fortune to meet a gentleman named Pete. He's the CEO of the mission here in town. And Thursday night, they're having a fundraiser at uh, Pike's Waterfront Hotel. Yeah. And he's got some tickets. He's going to be in the cove after service. If you want to pick up a ticket, all he asks is if you, if you get a ticket, go. There's going to be a raffle. Sounds a little bit like the Beast Feast where have different opportunities to raise funds. And so I just encourage you to step up and meet him out there. He's wearing a blue button-down shirt. Very official looking. Looks like a CEO. And take him up on his offer for a ticket to attend that event, okay? All right. This morning we're going to have a conversation about encounter. And Floyd and I were talking about this on Thursday. And I think it's something that we need to talk about corporately. And there's going to be two pieces to this today. It's about responding to an encounter and being willing to be sent to do something, okay? So it's kind of going to be act one and act two. If you, can, if you can stand that. And we're going to start with, if you have your Bible, open it up to Isaiah chapter 6. It's too long a passage to put up on the screen, but I'll, I'll read it to you. It's just the first few, ver well, maybe the first eight verses, okay? And it's going to set the stage for the conversation this morning. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, holding in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. And what happened in Isaiah's life as a result of being willing to be sent was a radical encounter. First, he has this radical encounter with God. God cleans him up instantly. And then he's put into this lifestyle of extraordinary service to God. What he was asked to do is amazing. And along the way, he had not only a cleansing of his lips, but of his inner, inner person, his heart and his mind. That coal touched so much more than just his lips. And it's through a radical encounter that our spiritual eyes and ears are open to what God can and will do us and He's going to begin to put us into situations and opportunities to share who he is with someone who's never heard the name of Jesus. 
I hear stories from people all the time about, oh, I know this person left the church. They've become an atheist. And we went to kids' ministry and high school ministry. And then we went off to college together and they've become an atheist. I don't understand why. When you've had an encounter with the risen Christ, you cannot turn your back on him. In this story, Isaiah was used as a prophet. If you read the entire book, you'll see that God put him in front of priests and kings, and he spoke the word of God to everyone to whom he was sent. I think that's one of the benefits of being a believer and listening for God's voice, is that he's going to call upon us to go and share something that he has in mind for someone else. But imagine that. You're sitting on your deck this afternoon, and God says, hey, I want you to go to Washington, D.C., and into the Oval Office, and I want you to tell President Biden this. Uh, mm. Or I want you to go to the Vatican and talk to the Pope or to this mosque in Iran and tell this to this imam. This is what Isaiah did. It sounds like something I want to do. How about you guys? If it doesn't, maybe it should. It's stepping into this type of radical encounter. But you know what? There's all this stuff that goes with it, all these great things I'm talking about. But on the other hand, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes I don't know if I can do that. I want to, God, but dot, dot, dot. As an example, God told Isaiah to remove his outer garment and walk around in just his tunic for three years, essentially walk naked, proclaiming his word. And it wasn't an affront to Isaiah, it was a threat and a warning to Egypt and Ethiopia. Do not mess with my people, or you're going to be paraded the same way after they conquer you. Friends, it's the encounter that makes the difference. If we're open to the encounter, we're going to see amazing things. When we surrender our hearts and our ideas to what God has in mind, those amazing things are going to begin to happen. I shared, you know, we've been talking about the, the wedding at Cana for a few weeks now. That's a great story. In that short passage is so much, it's so rich. And I shared a little bit about that at men's breakfast on Wednesday. It went okay. They didn't punch me out or anything. But there were a few people that looked at me like I had two heads. Because it was a call for us to do something. I get that a lot. I'm going to be honest with you. Because we use words sometimes that people, you've heard it, but maybe you don't understand what we're talking about. And I like to share testimony of things I've seen the Lord do that some people find hard to believe. My mother-in-law. I love her to death. She loves Jesus. She serves the Lord regularly and faithfully. We came home from a mission trip in 2013. We'd gone to the Philippines. And on that trip, she asked me, hey, how did it go? What, was, what went on? I said, surely would you believe me if I told you that the Lord opened a blind eye in front of me and two deaf ears while we were there? No. I wouldn't believe that. She didn't. She didn't have a paradigm or a mindset to put that in that made sense, that the God of the impossible is at work still today. I try not to let it bother me because it's important to share what, share what Jesus has done and is doing because what it does is it elevates the atmosphere and the environment of expectation and faith. When my, heart, my heart's desire is to see people go from ho-hum lives as believers to living lives on fire. On fire for God's word, his mission, his vision, his touch in my life and the lives of others as a result of taking the chance and being sent. I want to see Fairbanks have a radical encounter with Jesus. Desperately. And Floyd talked about this last week. He compared the showroom floor with the threshing floor. 
It's a tough journey. Remember a couple weeks ago, I shared the picture of the, the comfort zone, the fear zone, et cetera, et cetera. That's the same thing, going from that comfort zone to the growth zone. But it's on the threshing floor when we're tired and vulnerable that we have the encounter. When we get into that place of being tired and worn out and exhausted, who shows up and saves the day? Jesus. I mentioned a healing while we were in the Philippines. On that flight from Detroit to Manila, I had made up my mind that I was done with ministry. I'd been at it half a dozen years, and I'd had enough. And I told the Lord on the flight there, this is it. This is my last hurrah. I was going to go there and go through the motions. I'm being honest. And the first afternoon we're out there, this is what happens. This young woman's eye is opened. It's blind. I can see it's nothing there. All of a sudden, she has sight in it. And two people had deafness in their ears healed. And later that night, I'm laying in my bunk. I'm like, Papa, I don't get it. Why today, of all days, you want to do that? I'm done. He knows. He said, there's finally room for me. Now you're empty. And it's my strength that will shine in your weakness. His strength. And we talk, we've been talking about expectations, and Floyd talked about it last week, which I thought his message was awesome. And I think it's important that we continue to expand our thinking on how we can have an experience with God. But we have to be willing to contend for it, to position ourselves to experience it. I use that word a lot, contend. It may be a little bit confusing. Webster said, to strive for or vie for. That's how Webster's defines it. It requires effort and determination, two ingredients for a powerful meaning experience with God. But we need to be willing to be stretched. Without stretching, there's no growing. I can't look at the fob that I use to get into Planet Fitness and expect to see weight magically disappear. It'd be awesome, huh? It, it would be awesome, but that's not how it works. I have to be willing to work for it. It's the same with having an experience with God. It doesn't work to just kind of hope it happens. And neither does our faith. It doesn't grow by reading somebody else's stories or listening to what Greg or Floyd have to say. It's not how it works. Paul says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That comes from a passage out of Isaiah 53. If you read chapter 10, most of it, the first part of it comes out of Isaiah 53, where Isaiah says to the Lord, who has believed our report? A particular verse is in what's called the final servant song. It's actually the peak of Isaiah's messianic prophecy about Jesus, about how he will come and restore redeem and reveal all things who will believe our report that's why i share stories i share testimonies of who jesus is not for my sake but for his glory testimony is a very important facet of our experiences with god I remember when I first became a believer and people began to share testimonies around me, I felt the same way many people have. I was a little bit uncomfortable. Stories of God doing these amazing, amazing things that were, un, were unexpected. And it often made me doubt myself. Wow. The storyteller is telling these amazing things and I begin to look at myself, well, that's not me. I don't have that. What's wrong with me that God's not using me? Careful. <laughs> Careful. Because you all carry it. I don't care if you're a brand new believer, if this is the very first Sunday you've stepped in church in 20 years, he has still put it in you. Baby Christian, doesn't matter. We all carry a gift from him. 
I didn't like it because the storyteller wanted me to get off my safe spot and get busy out there in the kingdom. Sound familiar? Yeah. It's uncomfortable when we get called from the sideline to the middle of the field where the action's hot and heavy. But that's where the more and greater encounters with God take place. It's where God's at work and where we get to work alongside him. And he says, hey, guess what, Joan? Here's what I want you to do, kid. You're going to be great. Trust me. That's hard to do sometimes. But if we trust him and we step into it, the encounter that we have is going to be amazing, and we're going to be able to come away with it with a piece of testimony that may change someone else's spiritual trajectory. Testimony is important. If you don't believe me, look at what John the Revelator has to say. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We'll overcome him with the word of our testimony. That's why I try and share what's happened, what I've seen Jesus do in my life with people that I encounter along the way. Hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Maybe you don't know him, but here's what he does. And I want to brag just for a minute on a handful of people here who came to a class that I taught, I don't know, five, six years ago, a Holy Spirit class. And that group of people have taken the call to be sent, and they've gone out and they have done some amazing, amazing things. And we still fellowship together. We still get together, have coffee, hang out. One young woman in that group has traveled the world believing that God would provide all the things she needed to make it happen, and he has. And she's seen healings, salvations, and she's deliberately and intentionally shared the love of God with complete strangers. There's a couple who have become prayer warriors for the kingdom who believe what God has said about himself, that with him all things were possible. They're not afraid of anything now. And one man has probably led more people into a healing encounter with Jesus and into salvation than anybody I know that doesn't work in ministry. He's relentless. And I love it. And they are doing amazing things because they believe what God has said. They believe what Jesus revealed about himself and what the Holy Spirit has gifted with they've put to work in their lives. And when they step out in faith, they're seeing amazing encounters. Before service, I was talking with Norm, and he brought up this point. I, I really hadn't considered it much, but it's brilliant. Jesus didn't sit around waiting until 1 o'clock in the afternoon to go heal the man at the pool, did he? These were interruptions in his day. But he stops. It says in Scripture, he stopped for the one. And he will always stop for the one. And we should learn to do the same. Those folks I mentioned to you have witnessed what it means to work with God and how he calls upon us to work on his behalf. They've seen answered prayers and experienced outpourings of God's holy presence because they responded to the request to be sent. I want to see this become a common way of life for us, friends. Part of our everyday experience with God as believers. And it all is going to come about through an exercise of your faith. What is faith? Hmm? It's a very illogical thing, isn't it? To believe in something you cannot see, taste, touch, feel, or hear. Without it, my life's empty. I'm powerless. But with it, there's nothing that cannot be changed, no mountain that cannot be moved, no problem that can't be solved. And this is not intended to be a pun. I thought about it after I wrote this, though. 
the results of moving in faith are eye-opening. Eye-opening. Faith. The substance of things not seen, or excuse me, of hope, things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And I thought about this in the shower this morning. It just struck me. Two things described about faith in that short sentence. It's substance. It's not just a passing fancy. It is a substance. And number two, it is evidence. Evidence proving something. The worthiness of a God who calls upon his people to move, and when they move, he responds. You should write that down, Floyd. <laughs> we went to coffee. <laughs> we had coffee Thursday, and he was asking me about what I was going to say today, and I started out with, well, I don't know. I'll put something together. And he says, that's not what I wanted to hear. And as we started talking, this is what I was talking to him about. And just, we was having a wonderful conversation. He said, you should be taking notes. I said, no, son, you should be taking notes. <laughs> Where was I? Faith. Faith. We get called to go and do things. Jesus called the disciples together in Matthew 28. They're not disciples anymore. They're now apostles. What's the difference? Apostolos, the word in Greek, means to be sent. And he calls them together and says to them, all authority, not just a little, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's a lot in that passage, isn't it? Go. Go. It's a command. But what else did Jesus command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Those two. Those two commands but he also said go another time heal the sick cast out demons cleanse the lepers raise the dead we have a commission upon our lives to go to respond to being sent and i shared this verse this passage wednesday morning and i've shared it with people before and i've heard responses like you know what i'd love to go but i, I want to wait so I have more of the character of Jesus before I go, which that's good. I, you know, I'm not very good at praying, or I'm nervous. I don't know many verses. Why do we do that? Because we're afraid. I am. I'll be honest. I was afraid the first time. I said, we're going to get on a bus on Saturday morning and go pass out groceries to total strangers, and we're going to pray for them. I looked at Julie and I was like, boy, we better latch on to Floyd and them because I don't know what to do. I'm a brand new believer. But we dove into that deep end of the river. And we got out there by ourselves. We're passing out groceries and we look around and it's nobody left. It's just us. Between us, we've got like four months of faith, time as believers. She says, well, we better go. banged on the first door and a young woman answered the door and I said hi do you need some groceries and she's like yeah I do okay Whew. that's step one that's the hardest part right there is there anything we could pray about for you I swallowed real hard hoping she'd say no because Julie it was Julie's turn next <laughs> and she said yeah I need a car. Oh, God. I don't have faith for bus fare, let alone a car. But I opened my mouth and I started talking, and stuff was coming out, and I couldn't recall a word I said. 
right? And afterwards, Julia says, that was really good. I said, I, it wasn't me. I don't know what I said, but I hope whatever it was makes the difference. But when people tell me I don't have what it takes, Greg, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't believe enough. I'm going to ask them one simple question. Who said you have the right to determine when you're ready to obey his commands? Hmm? A mustard seed of faith. That's not my finger. That's a mustard seed. That's all the bigger it is. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. That's what Jesus said. But faith, friends, is the building block of our relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can read the exploits of average human beings who saw and did incredible things when they believed, obeyed, and responded to the call of an extravagant father. Their stories make up the spine of this book. They are the ones who set the standard for us. Here am I. Send me. I told you a couple Sundays ago, our first mission trip was to Honduras in 2006. And a few weeks before we get ready to go, we finally get to meet everybody that's going to be on the team because one of the couples that's going lives two hours east of where we live. And we're gathered in this room, and Pastor Kevin, who's leading the the mission trip, says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to introduce ourselves, say a little bit about yourself, and then maybe somebody out of Scripture that you want to say something about. And I didn't want to pick Jesus because everybody would pick Jesus. I had to think about it for a minute. We'll start with you, he says. Points at me. I I am Greg, Virgo. Um, Isaiah stands out to me. Why Isaiah? And I couldn't get the words to come out. I was so overwrought with emotion. I tried to say some words, but they wouldn't come. Because Isaiah stepped up. When God says, who's going to go for me? Isaiah said, here am I. Send me. It's in the being sent that amazing things happen. Answering and obeying what Jesus says and then responding to being sent. Turn your Bible to chapter, John chapter 9. It's one of the best stories in Scripture, in my opinion. It's the story of the healing of the blind man. At the end of chapter 8, verse 59, Jesus is having this verbal jujitsu with the Pharisees. And he says to them something that told them everything they needed to know about who he was. He says simply, before Abraham was, I am. Everything the Jews needed to know And here was spoken in those few words. I have to laugh. I think to myself, had they listened, if we go back to the beginning of that passage of Isaiah, keep on hearing but do not understand, keep on seeing but do not perceive. If the Jews would have been able to hear and perceive, everything may have been different, but they couldn't. It says they even took up stones against him, but he hid himself and moved through their midst. We begin in chapter 9. The disciples are sitting outside the temple because that's where they are now. They've moved out of the temple. And they ask the question, who sinned, Lord? He or his parents that he was born blind? Remember Old Testament teaching says there was a sin somewhere. Either the, the person with the infirmity or their parents sinned. That's how they ended up like this. Remember, that's more of this. Remember, we did this a couple weeks ago, this old wine thinking. And I kept coming over here on purpose. I hope you put that together. It's to prove a point. That we think about things in the old way of thinking about things when God's doing something new and different. Blindness in this story is both in the natural and the supernatural. They don't get it. 
Sounds just like the story in John chapter 5, the other guy at the pool. But Jesus, Jesus ushers in some new thinking here when he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God may be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. For the night is coming when no one can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I told you two weeks ago, John has Jesus and the Jews on opposite sides of every argument in this, doesn't he? And Jesus rightly assesses here that the spiritual condition of Israel, that they had no understanding of the supernatural, none of this new wine stuff, and he also rightly assesses that they're spiritually blind. It validates Jesus' point. And he uses the blind man as the conduit to reveal that God the Father himself wishes to be revealed. And I love this. When Jesus saw the man's condition, he spat and made mud and then anointed the eyes of the man and told to go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which also means sent. This entire book is about coming close, having an encounter, receiving everything we need in life, and then being sent. That's miraculous, isn't it? That's no small thing, as Jesus would say. This is no small thing. Could you put up that map of Jerusalem? Awesome, thank you. This is from the first temple period. If you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see the word temple and palace? The two rectangles, you see them? In the bottom right-hand corner is the pool at Siloam, okay? This is just to give you an idea about what happened in this story. I've always been baffled at it. To be fair, this man is blind. There's no mention of a helper. They don't have service dogs then to assist him. He has to walk and feel his way along from the temple, outside the temple, to the pool. Right? I used a little scale. Whoop. There's a little scale on the map there. If you look at it, it gives you a rough approximation. That's about 600 yards feeling your way in the dark. Back in Ohio, I know people that can't get out of a corn maze that's 100 yards long. And here he goes. And the man travels to the pool. He responded to being sent. He washed. He was obedient. And he receives his sight. It was literally a blind faith in the person of Jesus Christ that compelled him to do these things. I just want a little bit of that man's faith. Come on. And once the man is given his sight, what happens? It says the Pharisees bust him immediately. As usual, they're angry about something. I mean, they've just got a beef about everything in, in the gospel, don't they? They don't get this Jesus thing that everybody's talking about. And they're upset because Jesus spat and made mud on the Sabbath. Like that's a big thing. But this is the only place in the Gospels where someone other than Jesus is talking about the goodness of God the Father. The blind man takes up defense of Jesus. And he tells this whole story. He responds over and over and over to the Pharisees quizzing him about what, what happened. He keeps telling the story again and again. And it's a big contrast, isn't it, from the story in John chapter 5 we talked about two weeks ago. That guy said, I don't know who this is. Some man told me to pick up my stuff and go. But the man, the blind man says, a man called Jesus healed me. He says simply, one thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. Is, is just anybody show of hands who've been blind? blind to the goodness of Jesus Christ. And he finishes this up with a gut punch to the Pharisees. 
I mean, it's a beauty. Do you wish to become his disciples also? And that just infuriates him. And they kick him out of the synagogue because that's what happens. That's the penalty for disagreeing with the elite. They kick him out of the synagogue. And the metaphor in this story is very clear. Jesus makes it easily understood. He will come and he will reveal the truth and he will let the blind see that truth. They're one and the same. And here the same thing applies to us. When our eyes, when the eyes and the ears of our hearts are opened, we're going to see what we're supposed to do and we're going to recognize the fact that everything we need to do it is in front of us. Since I started coming to this church in 2015, I've heard it being said out loud during the service. Floyd, you're really stretching me. You're making me uncomfortable. No. We need to be stretched. And this, this, man, this man proclaims to the world the name of Jesus. How many here have done that? Proclaim the name of Jesus, the love of Jesus. And let it come out in everything you do and say. We went to Walmart yesterday. We had to pick up some film. And I was getting a little bit agitated because we couldn't find someone that could open up the case to sell us film. Our lives have become that crazy that somebody's stealing film for a kid's camera. And I was ready to just like... Rum, 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 rum let all kind of stuff out and finally a young man opens the case and sets the camera or the film on the counter and the first thing out of his mouth you look familiar you go to friends church yeah i do you he says yeah i came last sunday it was my first time i said oh great on the way out to the car i held julie's hand i said i'm glad i didn't blow my witness <laughs> and just undo everything jesus had done in this young man Right? Later on in the passage, Jesus comes back on this man. He comes up to him again, just like in the man in John chapter 5, after he's been put out of the synagogue, and he says well, just a few words to Jesus. Or Jesus says a few words to him. And what happens? He recognizes all he knew of Jesus was his voice. And he falls at Jesus' feet and worships him. But he's already confessed that he's a disciple now. Because he asked the Pharisees, do you wish to be his disciples also? Of course, that whole thing tees up my sheep hear my voice in John chapter 10. But this blind man is healed while the blindness of Israel is revealed. A little freestyle rap there, do you catch that? And the faith it must have taken to go through that ordeal is amazing. But we're in a position today, friends, to walk into the same kind of encounters if we're willing. And it has not and never will be about your ability as a believer. Jesus is only concerned with your availability to serve him, to serve his Father. And when we're open to serving the Lord, he's going to uh, bring about to us the anointing. He's going to give us the words, and he's going to put his power into the situation to make sure that his desired outcome is achieved. When we're open to being sent, which this is all about today, being sent. This is, this is K1, K2, and MK3 all at once. This is a buffet. When we're open to that, we're going to walk into the purpose that God has for our lives in this season. And then in the next season, not everybody's going to be called to be an Isaiah. It's not for all of us. Some are called to be prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. Some of us are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to go and love on someone intentionally. Think about all the people during this pandemic that didn't speak to another soul, didn't see another person face to face. 
when we have the opportunity and we have the power within us to go someplace and just love on someone intentionally, keeping safe, doing all those things we need to do, but going and showing the love of Jesus. We have that in us, friends. We have a purpose upon our lives. We have the privilege of discovering God's will in our lives as his people, a privilege and a challenge to be of service to our king. If we'll listen to his voice and respond. Who else besides me wants to have those kind of encounters? You know what I'm saying? You want to be called on. You want Jesus to, to say your name. Let me give you five things to consider. We're going to wrap up here. Five things. If you want to set yourself up to have a deep personal encounter with the Father, some, some simple things to do. It doesn't matter if you're a new believer or someone that's been around the church all your life. Number one is seek him out. Be deliberate, purposeful, and intentional. I was sharing with Floyd Thursday that my goal each week, every Monday morning on this device, it tells me my weekly screen time report, how much time I've been Angry Birds and Facebook and whatever else. My goal each week is to see that have a down arrow. Your time decreased this much because there's so much junk drawing our attention away from Jesus. It creates what Floyd calls the phantasmagoria. It fills our thoughts with all kinds of craziness, conspiracy theories, aliens, UFOs, all these things to think about that does what? It distracts us from hearing the voice of the king. Number two, prayer. Be specific and be relentless. Ask God to put you in situations and then allow him to reveal his desires for you. He'll bring everything you need to the situation. I promise. But be careful about how you pray. You don't want to pray for patience. It's going to be a bad day because you will be tested. Number three, be obedient. There's that word again. Floyd told me two weeks ago, don't say obedient. Why? What we're called to do is obey. If you don't like the word obedient because it feels legalistic, be in agreement. Be in agreement. Isaiah went. The blind man went. Be willing to go. You'll be glad you did. Number four, listen. It's the most neglected communication skill of them all, listening. And I have people, I, I get blessed to do this all the time. I meet somebody during my work week, and they're telling me about something that's going on, and they're looking for me to pray for them. I don't even ask. I just feel it. And while I'm listening to them, I tune one ear to heaven. God, what do you want to do? because I don't have any idea how to deal with this. I'm not a counselor. I can't do that. I mean, I, if I went to school for it, I suppose, but it's not my gifting. But I love people, so I've got one ear tuned to heaven and one ear listening to what's going on here. And when they're done, I say, Let's, can I pray for you? Is that okay? And we pray. When you hear what he says, take the steps he desires. And number five, remove fear and hesitation. You have what it takes. Taking a risk to walk across the room or travel around the world is well within you. You have everything you need if you believe him. And your journey will be incredible. When we're faithful in the little things, friends, we will see the greater things. That's what it says in Scripture. Having the character of Christ is great. Don't get me wrong. But I want to see his will fulfilled. Because for me, that's the greater portion. And I believe that one day when we stand before him, and I don't know about y'all, but this is, this is how it is for Greg. I want him to look at the body of work in my life. It's not so much that stuff I did as a young guy. 
But when I came around, I want him to look at that body of work. And say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. From one obedient act of going, we can change the city of Fairbanks. And Julie and I have been talking about this recently. Pastor and Date used to say this all the time. I want to leave Fairbanks better than I found it. And that takes all of us. Now, we're going to pray for encounters, so I hope you all are ready for encounters this week. We're going to pray for encounters. And then we have one last song. I know we ran a little bit long. I blame <clears throat> Floyd. Um, but... <sighs> Reminder, Mr. Pete will be out front with tickets to the rescue mission event Thursday night at Pike's Waterfront Hotel. See him if you want to go. They're free, by the way. If you say you're going to go, go. Don't take a ticket and not go. But when we're done, there's one song we're going to play. And when I first became a believer, this song was on the CD that, the, that this group had out at the time. And it was one of two songs on that that really struck me. It's called, Here Am I, Send Me. All right, if you want to stay and sing along, it's a good song. If you want to dance, dance. You can sing along if you know the words. If not, just hum. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being with us today as our guest. And I pray, Lord God, that each person here that desires to have an encounter with you this week and in the coming weeks has an incredible encounter that you bring about amazing revelation in each person for the things you have for them to do in this season. And then you deposit into them all the tools that they need to accomplish that job. Father, our desire is to see Fairbanks better than when we first got here. And that can only come about, Lord God, through people who are willing to respond to your call to go. And so, Jesus, I'm praying this week for those that are called to go to take up what you have for them to do, be fully equipped with everything they need in that season, and then go. I bless each person here today whose heart is to see Fairbanks better than they found it whose heart is to see their neighbors lifted up we are not powerless friends we serve an amazing god and he's waiting for those who will go on his behalf and so lord i just i just lift up this group this morning and say they are ready to go give them the opportunities and Father God, let their report back here in the coming weeks be amazing, be filled with stories of people whose lives are changed, who want to know you more and step into their own relationship. It's in your mighty name we pray, Lord. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you want to hang around and sing. Amen. All right. Hit it, Austin. <laughs>